Good evening. I'd like to call the order of the Washington County Quorum Court to order. Tonight's uh, prayer and pledge will be by Justice Joel Maxwell. Dear Lord, thank you so much for the opportunity we have to make choices and set our own destiny. God, I pray that you would guide us with wisdom. God, that you would give us the correct mission, help us to find the right methods, and that you would keep our motives right. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Justice Maxwell. The uh, next order is a roll call. Carly, please. Daniel Balls. Here. Harvey Bowman. Rick Cochran. Here. Robert Dennis. Here. Lisa Eckie. Here. Ann Harbison. Sharon Lloyd. Here. Tom Lundstrom. Here. Eva Madison. Here. Sue Madison. Joe Maxwell. Here. Gary McHenry. Joe Patterson. Butch Pond. Here. Bill Essery. I believe we have a quorum. Uh, we need to uh, adopt the, our agenda. We have an item 7.1. Yes? And we add 7.1 and move it to um, 4.1 so that, or I'm sorry, 5.1 so that uh, Mr. Woods can make his other schedules as well. I have a motion. Any second? Motion and a second. All right. We'll vote. All in favor of approving the agenda with the addition of the 7.1 inserted at 5.1? Say aye. Aye. Any opposed? And it passes. The agenda is passed. Uh, tonight, the next item is the citizen comment. We'll have a 15 minute period for comment. Each person is limited to a maximum of three minutes. Uh, anyone would like to make a comment? Come forward, please. State your name and no citizens comments. Don't be shy. We don't fight. Yes, anything? No comments? All right. We'll move on to uh, 7.1. It's an ordinance. I'll have uh, Attorney Zega please read Thank this. Chairman, may I have your copy, please? Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> an ordinance appropriating the amount of $81,750 from the general fund to the building and grounds budget for 2016, Article 1. There is hereby appropriated the total amount of $81,750 from the general fund to the following line items in the buildings and grounds budget for 2016. Rent, machinery, $2,249. Other professional services, $7,470. Machinery and equipment, $72,031 for a total appropriation of $81,750. Thank you, Attorney Zagan. Uh, this uh, was brought to our attention that we've had a pretty serious uh, failure. Uh, by Ron. Ron, do you want to speak to this briefly? Nope. Okay. We we, we talked about it Tuesday night. Uh, I'll entertain a motion. Second. We have a motion and a second. Will you call the roll, please? What? Nope. May I, oh, Mr. Excuse Chairman? Me. There are 10 of you here. Um, this is an appropriation ordinance. This would be one where, um, mm -hmm. if you were so inclined, your vote would be necessary. Um, and. Just right. Oh, that's right. Yes, Excuse that me. is Free correct. Public comment. Anyone care to make any public comment on this ordinance? And there are none. All right. Now we'll call the roll. Ann Harbison. Sharon Lloyd. Yes. Tom Lundstrom. Yes. Eva Madison. Yes. Sue Madison. Joe Maxwell. Yes. Gary McHenry. Joe Patterson. Butch Pond. Yes. Bill Essery. Yes. Daniel Balls. Yes. Harvey Bowman. Rick Cochran. Yes. Robert Dennis. Lisa Ecke. Yes. The motion or the ordinance passes. Appreciate it. Moving into topic number six is our 2017 budget review. The first one up is for Circuit Court 3 with Stacey Zimmerman. There will be uh, pages 558 and 5186. Come on down. Thank you very much. And I'm wondering if I can roll another chair over for Ms. Frisbee. Oh, she's got one. She's fast. Thank you. All right. So we have our budget that we submitted, and we've moved some items around in the juvenile court budget. 
And I'd like to first start to see if you have any questions about where we moved various items, and then we can get into the request for three additional po uh, positions that we're requesting. We're requesting two more juvenile officers and a social worker counselor. We have teamed with the Jones Center. We have a Mr. Gilbert here today, Mr. Mike Gilbert with the Jones Trust. We also have Maddie Hudson with the Teen Action Support Center. <coughs> And they provide, the Teen Action Support Center provides various services to youth, public service, counseling services, mentoring services. And the request that we're making is for an evening reporting center in downtown Springdale. In the packet that you received, we have a chart that shows the increased number of referrals from law enforcement officers in Springdale versus in Fayetteville. And as you can see from the bar chart that you have in your packet, we made it orange and yellow for Halloween. And in that packet, you can see the increased number of referrals in the orange on the bar chart in Springdale versus the slight increase in Fayetteville. And then the last um, several months, we've had a slight decrease. And that's just for um, through August in 2016. And as you know, we've had an increase in the number of violent crimes in uh, Springdale area, specifically some gang-related activity that seems to be on the rise. So as one of the model sites in Arkansas for the Juvenile Detention Alternative Initiative, that's a, that's a nationwide program, we've really looked at different models to reduce the number of kids that are being arrested, that are committing crimes in our community, and reduce the number of kids that go into lockup and obviously reduce the number of kids that end up in prison. And one of the models, and the data shows this to be true, an evening reporting center for kids that are at high risk to offend or moderate risk to offend in the community, if you have an evening reporting center that they can go to in their community that's easy to access, that has close monitoring, that has services right there where they can work on their homework, they can get their individual counseling at that evening reporting center, that they can also meet with their probation officer because the two probation officers are right there on site. And so we've partnered with the Jones Trust who's agreed to let us have space in the JTL building, which is right across the street from the Archer Learning Center in downtown Springdale, which Justice uh, Lloyd can tell you about, is the alternative school for Springdale. So we would have these services for 10, we want to start out with 10 high risk, moderate use risk, coming from school right after school across the street to the evening reporting center, where they will stay until 8.30 or 9 at night working on these different issues, counseling, homework, mentoring, all the services would be right there. And then the parents would come pick them up or we would transport them home and we would rotate 10 at a time. So we'd always have 10 high risk to moderate risk teens. And so this is something that I believe will work. Santa Cruz, uh, California has evening reporting centers. We visited the one in California. They have evening reporting centers in Portland, Oregon that work and I really believe that if we don't do something soon that this situation is going to get so out of control that we're not going to be able to stem the tide that we have. We've spoken, we've partnered with Springdale Law Enforcement, they're supportive of this. We've spoken with the Jones Center, obviously Mr. Gilbert is here, they're in support of that. Our Teen Action Support Group uh, that provides services to Benton County Juvenile Court they have an office in Benton County. They're also going to be able to be in the same building provided by the Jones Trust for the first year of free rent. And they will provide free services to these juveniles. And so we're asking for two juvenile officers that would be cross-trained law enforcement because we don't want moderate to high risk teens being there with just one probation officer. We also have partnered with the Division of Youth Services which is the entity, as you know, in Little Rock where a kid is committed to DYS 
They have committed $10,000 to us that will purchase our furniture, our equipment, our computers for the kids to do their homework on, and they have already uh, promised us that. So it would just be funding these three positions. The third position would be a licensed social worker who can provide group counseling to those kids when they're there at the center and individual counseling. Uh, and also assessment for these high-risk youth so we can get them into services in the community to prevent them from going down the road of being in lockup and then going on to prison. And as you've you read in the paper, we've had a lot of violence, escalating violence, and most of those kids that are now in the adult system, 65% of those kids, I would have gone in their house and sat down and eaten dinner with them and their families. So I really believe that those, I mean, there's going to be a small segment that's not going to be able to be reached, but there's a very large segment of these kids that are at crossroads. And we had, um, we had the principal at Springdale Schools, uh, Mr. Patrick, in court just the other day, and he said, you know, Judge, this kid can go either way. He, he's smart, he's great, he has a wonderful mom, but he's starting to do that gang thing, and if we can get him going the right direction now, not only is it the morally the right thing to do, it's the smart thing economically to do. You're going to save the, the cost of locking them up. So I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Uh, Frisbee. She might expand on some of the points that I've left out. But we're asking for $145,000 for the three new positions, actually $145,127 for new position for the three new positions that would be housed in Springdale at the Jones, uh, at the JTL shop area, uh, right there where it's centrally located to these families that need the most help. Yes, Your Honor. The only uh, thing I would like to add is that part of what we've learned with uh, being part of the JDAI, um, the Juvenile Detention Alternatives Initiative, is that we have to bring the services to where the need is at. We can't just sit in our office and expect our families to make it to our offices and for these services to work. For them to work, we have to bring it to where the need is. And right now, our data shows that the need is in Springdale, and we have an opportunity right now that the Jones Center is offering us a whole year of free rent and utilities to be able to get this program up and running and to be able to come back in a year and show you and bring you data that the program is working. If it's not working in a year, then fine, let's get rid of it. But I, I assure you that it's going to work. That's all I wanted to add. Okay. And um, could you, Mr. Gilbert, come forward? I'll give up my seat to you and you just keep yours. And let you talk a little bit about the Jones Trust and the commitment to our youth in Springdale and some of your thoughts. Good evening. My name is Mike Gilbert. I'm Chief Operating Officer of the Jones Trust and the Jones Center for Families. And I'm here to support the judge and Ms. Frisbee and the teenagers of Springdale tonight for a very particular reason. They need us. They need somebody close to home to love on them and to help guide them in the direction of success. I've seen this happen before uh, with a young Marshallese man on our campus. Uh, he'd gotten in a little bit of trouble. I went to the to court with him and asked the judge if he would release him into one of the youth programs we have. Uh, found out at that time he had a great deal of fines. I met and visited with him every day and he paid off all of his fines and he has a job right now supervising other teens. And, and that's personal experience of loving on these kids and making a difference in their lives and they need it. And so when the judge just asked for the 140 whatever thousand dollars it was, I turned to one of my cohorts here tonight and I asked the question, what does it cost to incarcerate a teen? I didn't know the answer, so I Googled it. We all know Google's not right, but locking up a juvenile cost states an average of $407.58 per day, 148767 per person per year. I'm sure this came from California, we're in Arkansas, that number's probably half of that. So if you incarcerate three teens, you're gonna pay that $145,000 that the judge is asking for. And more importantly, if you give us the opportunity, here's what happens. You have, you have socioeconomically challenged families in Springdale that are in the middle of all of this trouble. 
and they need to have their parents engaged in the process of, of working together to change their lives and get them on the right track. And so they have to come all the way down here between the hours of 8 and 5, and they're already challenged, so they have to lo lose a day of work to get down here. And they don't make that decision a lot of times, and it's really, really sad. But on our campus, we have all kinds of youth services, family services. We're kind of like a one-stop serve in downtown Springdale. Downtown Springdale is investing a lot of money in revitalizing the town. And we're revitalizing downtown Springdale to be inclusive for everybody, including our troubled children. And we want to help them right in the middle of downtown where they live, where they can walk from school to our campus. We've got a group uh, included in this space that we're talking about. It's about 4,000 square feet, and it's got a big, huge group room about probably half the size of, of this building, of this room. And so if you can picture you walk in the door and you check in on the right and you go in and you visit with your counselor in the, counsel in the probation officer's office and then you go in and you visit with the counselor and then you go into a work room and you get your homework done and then you go across the hall into the big youth innovation laboratory which is a group of teens that are doing the right thing, that are doing public art projects and community service projects. And the connection with Teen Action Support Center is that they are the leaders of of community service in the community and they have constructive opportunity for kids to engage with the community and see the different side and what Teen Action has found and I believe Ms. Hudson will share that with you if you give her the opportunity a lot of their a lot of their uh, clients and customers that come for community service exceed the, the mandated hours because they're engaged and they're productive and they feel good about themselves and that's what we want to do and so the difference of a teen that goes into incarceration as a teenager and learns how to be a prisoner for the rest of his life versus a teenager who grows into a productive part of our town is really, really important to us. And I've spoken with my board at, about this extensively. I've spoken with a lot of the community members about this. And I know that we're, you know, there's another deal going on up in Springdale that everybody's all up in a tizzy about. But you know what? It's got to happen in our yard if it's our people, and we got to love on them directly. And so I just ask you to please strongly consider this request and make an investment in the kids that we care about. Thank you. You got any questions? I believe Lisa. Justice Aki. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think this is fantastic, Judge, but I'm not surprised that you would go after a pro program like that and bring it to Washington County because that is just who you are and Ms. Frisbee, and that's the heart of what you're doing at JDC. Um, I do have a question whether or not you've reached out to um, the Extension Service and the 4-H. I want Jeannie Mack to tell you a little bit about that because we started out with a, a summer program, kind of a little piece trying to try it out in the summer to see if we could carry it over to an evening reporting center. So we did 10 high-risk, moderate-risk kids this summer. And as part of that, they had Extension officers from the extension service come and teach them sewing I and mean, we're talking talk yes guys. so Jeannie tell, tell them a little if bit about you've that. come to the mic real quick please this is being televised so our viewing audience would like to hear what um, I think we've explained before our summer program we're in our second year of the summer program and actually <clears throat> the first year is when we had the extension agents um, they, they didn't have the staff to do that this year. So we, um, just all of us from juvenile uh, court and myself, um, did all the activities with the kids and it was sponsored by a private donator. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really tough to, yes. it went over $10,000, the, the things that we did do with the kids. Cause we fed them, we picked them up sure. and we, we took them back home as well. Sure, it sounds like to me, I know we didn't fund a 4-H extension officer this year, um, but it's not done yet. And I'm working hard to see if we can get that funding. So it's not just for the 4-H select group. It goes, it reaches all the way into the troubled youth. Yes, ma'am. And into the senior citizens home where they do a lot of their volunteer work. Mm -hmm. But I know that the numbers are declining in rural, I mean, in, um, in Springdale, and they would like to see more participation and they're looking for um, the Hispanic group 
they're saying, how can we reach them? You know, how can we reach the Marshallese? They have a lot of information that they culturally that they bring to us on um, planting, on how do they, you know, harvest their foods, their little home gardens, and what did they do, and and so on. So we have a lot to to learn from one another. This past but, weekend, we actually went to a community garden with our group of kids. Uh, and they did some community service there. I think that's excellent. Well, I think, Court, I'd like to just one more time for the 4-H, um, whether the state wants to fund them or not, I know that our youth is worth the investment. And if we could invest in that agent, look how broad his responsibility goes. It's not just to the 4-H club. It's not an exclusive club. It reaches to every corner of this of this county, and those are at risk. And if we can say we went ahead and invested in this program and turned a generation around, we are going to be the recipients and better for it because we did spend $65,000 to invest in a 4-H extension agent. So, but I support you in what you're doing. I'm excited about this and you have my vote, yes. Well, thank you. Can I have one more speaker before I give up the floor? Certainly. All right. And I'll say one yes, more thing you before may. that other speaker, okay. please. Please come to the mic. This is kind of important. So, living in the nonprofit world, we realize that, that you know, there are a lot of challenges and funding challenges exist also. And, and so, we're, we're building this collaboration of nonprofit organizations, the court, actually the university also, because that's how we're going to be successful in the future. And we have to be very judicious with the dollars that we spend. And the piece that I didn't, I don't, I don't even believe I shared it with the judge yet because I'm still kind of working on this. But we're going to have uh, interns, they're working on their masters from the university, hopefully. Uh, we've been working with Dr. Margaret Reed and Dr. Rogelio Contreras to put social work, social innovation students in there to study our work and report on our work. And part of the, the reason that the Jones Trust wanted to grant this space for 12 months is to provide for the judge and the court system the opportunity to show you the outcomes. And then if we're able to deliver, then that investment makes a lot of sense. And the other piece that's happening in the next couple of days actually, is there's a Springdale garden, a community garden in Springdale right down the street from this reporting center that uh, is being operated by uh, one of the youth programs currently on our campus. And the expectation would be that Teen Action and Support Center would utilize this community garden uh, in collaboration with feed communities actually to drive the students into that community garden and that be part of the teaching lesson. And of course, then they would also be taking the food home. Okay. Did you have? Thank you, Judge Zimmer. And you have one more speaker. Yes, I wanted to introduce Miss Maddie with the Teen Action Support Center, and her uh, group would be also housed in the 4,000 square foot area that Mr. Gilbert spoke about. So I'm going to turn it over to Miss Maddie. Uh, yes, I'm with the Teen Action Support Center, and we empower teens to take action both first in their own lives, but then in their communities. We offer a continuum of services. And recently, we launched in a, been, or Washington County last year. Uh, we run, um, we actually have 33 teens at Archer in our First Steps program. Um, that's for te pe pregnant and parenting teens. So we work with teens that come from all different walks of life, whether that is through the juvenile justice system, also those that are pregnant and parenting. We work with homeless teens and also teens that are leaders in the community. Um, and we bring them all together in one innovative place um, and offer them a continuum of services. Uh, what we've seen in Benton County is that uh, we've served hundreds of teens. We serve uh, over 200 a month and uh, through this program that they're discussing. Um, and those that come and serve with us, at least one in four, let's say they come, in, come to us with community service hours to do um, that they're mandated to do through the courts, one in four of them not only stays with us after their hours, but stays at least double the time to serve alongside our mentors. They do hundreds of projects in the community. And um, so we offer six to eight service projects per week during the school year and 11 to 15 during the summer per week. Um, and they are being mentored 
So this is a huge leap from the teens that we saw picking up trash off the side of the road 15 years ago. Um, now they are being mentored every step of the way. And then we take it from there and they start creating their own projects and their own um, social entrepreneurship ventures in the community. Uh, so we work with some uh, many youth in Springdale and Rogers, um, starting in Fayetteville as well, and Bentonville, who are um, leaders in the community or even have come from these places of coming to us through the juvenile courts and now are creating their own service projects in the community. Um, so one of those is he came to us to serve 78 hours um, and he's now served over 200 since March and he used all of the money that he had raised, which he didn't, doesn't come from a home that has a lot of money, but uh, he started serving out at Autumn's Reride Youth Ranch in Benton County and fell in love with a horse out there and the horse needed surgery. So he took all of the money that he had raised to buy an Xbox and donated it to the horse. <laughs> Uh, to, and now he's running fundraisers and learning how to start his own organization to help fund this horse. So these are the types of things that we do with teens. We take them from a place of brokenness and criminal activity and then not only bring them back to functional stable, but also take them to the other side where they are being uh, contributive citizens, where they are learning um, all sorts of job skills. Um, so, and just to give you an idea, our, our teen parents, like at Archer, we have, like I said, we have teen parents we meet with there every single week. They would be able to just come over the street, come across the street. There's a bus stop right in, right in front of the, um, the center that we're talking about. And uh, in our First Steps program, while only, some of you may know, only 38% of teen parents graduate high school nationally by age 20, 93% of the teens in our program graduate high school on time. Yes, so th these are the types of things we'd be able to do and not just offer them community service opportunities, but to, they'd come into the Evening Reporting Center and be offered up a whole uh, realm of different services based on what their life situation offers. So we'd love to, um, for you to give us the opportunity to show you what we can do. Thank you. Just a sec, are you complete? I know that a positive youth program is what this, this county needs and especially Springdale and representing Springdale. But I am amazed at the possibility of what y'all can do and what y'all are gonna start. And I would really like this court to reconsider where we're putting money because I really believe that we need to invest in people's lives. And if we can change a life, it's worth it. It's worth it. So thank you, Judge. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Thank you, Justice Ecke. Next I have Justice Lloyd. Thank you, Chairman. Um, you know I deal with at-risk youth, so, uh, so this interests me. But on the funding issue, on the licensed social worker, I know that Medicaid will do a lot of group therapy. Have, has, that been, has that avenue been invested that maybe we could do some Medicaid billing for the licensed social worker? Our area provider is YouthBridge. Okay. And YouthBridge is the one that gets the DYS contract money, which is about $900,000 a year. And those families that have Medicaid, they bill it to save that money. I don't know about how you would, how a county would bill Medicaid for a professional service through a licensed social worker who's providing uh, counseling. So, so we're already utilizing Ozark Guidance Center. Okay. And we're utilizing YouthBridge, and we're us utilizing Day Springs as the outpatient counseling and those facilities all do the Medicaid so we can try to save that DYS pot of money for people that don't have that coverage so we're utilizing that already and we still have such a need because there are not enough counselors to go around and then you have these parents that are making below poverty wages they can't take off to get their kid to the office in you know youth bridge office in Fayetteville for counseling so we're, we are trying to utilize every hat in every area that we have out there. And so the long answer is yes, but I don't think we could utilize Medicaid to pay for any of the counseling services that this position would provide. Okay, so the licensed social worker would be a full-time group full -time therapy? Group therapy and individual therapist right there at the center. 
Okay, when you said that the, the juvenile officers would be cross-trained, they would cross, be? They would be cross-trained law enforcement. So they are able to carry a gun. They've been trained as a law enforcement officer. We have three cross-trained officers at juvenile court in Washington County on Clydesdale. So if there is an issue, there's an emergency, they're trained to respond right then. Right, and, and what, el what else are they trained in? With the ju they're not trained in any kind of counseling? No, no, they oh. would just be strictly a juvenile officer with cross-training as to law enforcement. And then you would need the counseling. Correct. Right. Right. And may I add that in addition to that, um, judge also orders um, mental health assessments for purpose of finding proper resources for the youth. And right now we have uh, social works at JDC. So if a kid goes to detention, they're able to be assessed there immediately and they provide a detailed report to the court as far as what the, some of the issues are with these like youth. Substance abuse, substance abuse. individual counseling. Right. But are, are, these, are these kids, not, I don't, I don't want to double dip these kids. Are these kids not already getting OGC services? No. And no. No? no. These are going to be... Mm -hmm. Kids that are not being serviced. Yes, ma'am. Um, at, at those places. They will yes. not be getting double dipped. These are the kids that are skating on, getting uh, kicked out of school. Archer Learning Center is their last alternative stop before they're kicked out of school. So we're just trying to keep them in school and keep them out of trouble. And we can barely do that without ordering them to get to counseling at OGC here or Youth Bridge over here. So they have not, we might have tried counseling, but then it didn't work for usually transportation issues. Okay. All right, thank you. That was a good question. I hadn't thought of that. Thank you, Justice Lloyd. Uh, next is uh, Justice Dennis. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I guess what I'd like to say is this. I did the same. I was doing the math that you were doing, and I came up with $233,600 if, if these 10 went to jail per year. And that would just be our part. That's not total, total, total. That's just county's part. So I, I agree with your presentation on that. And I'll say right up front, I'm biased. Judge Zimmerman is my hero. I, uh, anything she says, I believe totally. I've seen her in work and I've seen her results. And uh, I can tell you she's correct. If you can take a young man and turn him in the right direction, the example that I would uh, give, and I'm not going to name names, but I calculated what I thought he paid in taxes the last 15 years, and uh, you know, at 20,000, at 20,000 a year, he pays in taxes. So 15 years times 15 times that uh, is that 300,000. So did he pay back what you invested in him? I'd say 10 times, uh, maybe 100 times as much. Because if he'd gone to jail instead of going to Bentonville, then uh, been a lot of difference. So I'd like to move that we accept this proposal offered by Judge Zimmerman second. and pass it on. I have a motion and a second. Is there any other discussion? <laughs> Justice Hussery. Thank you very much. I, uh, I live in Springdale, and unfortunately, unfortunately, almost all these people are in my particular district. And <clears throat> I understand what the problem is, and I also wor I work with kids every week on the elementary age in, in a, a very large apartment complex there in Springdale. And I certainly see the need, and I, I applaud you for coming forward with this uh, kind of a, 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 a new way, something new, and, and, and I'm very grateful for what you're doing. And uh, I'll definitely support this. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you, Justice. Thank you, Justice Osiris. Any other comments? If not, then Carly, would you call the roll on a vote? And Carly, since we now have more than 10, you won't need to include me unless there is a tie. Thank you. Ann Harbison? Sharon Lloyd? Yes. Tom Lundstrom? Yes. Eva Madison? Yes. Sue Madison? Yes. Joe Maxwell? Yes. Gary McHenry? Joe Patterson? Yes. Butch Pond? Yes. Bill Ussery? Yes. Daniel Balls, yes. Harvey Bowman, Rick Cochran, Robert Dennis, yes. Lisa Eckie. Yes. And it passes. So we'll next we'll go to 5-186. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry. I'm aware that Judge Zimmerman has another 
non-juvenile budget yeah, that she needs to talk little, about. It's a little quick thing. We did not, however, put it on the agenda. So uh, it's it deals with the uh, court reporter for the jail. Um, so uh, and it, is it in your packets? I've handed it out to everybody. Okay. Okay, I would just move to suspend the rules and allow this to be added to the agenda at this point in time. I have a motion and a second to suspend the rules and add this to the agenda. I'll do a voice vote. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? And it passes. Okay. You mean it passed so I didn't even have to say anything? No, it passes oh. that you can speak on. Oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> nice okay. try. Ah. Okay. Whew. Okay, first I want to say thank you so much for passing that. I think that's a huge victory for kids and families in Springdale. So as administrative judge, um, part of my job is to bring to you what our agreement is as circuit judges. And historically, Ray Reynolds has served as the, uh, basically the magistrate down at the jail who hears first appearance 8.1 hearings and arraignments when defendants are taken to jail, they have to have a hearing right away. And so Judge Reynolds has heard those Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Beginning January the 1st, uh, Judge Reynolds' position will no longer be needed because the district judges have agreed for Washington County, Judge Graham Nation and Judge Casey Jones, district judges, will hear 8.1 and arraignment hearings on Mondays and Wednesdays down at the jail. They are not a court of record. They do not have a court reporter. So we need a court reporter. And the one that uh, Judge Reynolds has used, Martha Brown, for the last 13 years, uh, reports there at the jail. She uh, keeps all of the tapes for all the proceedings. And I'm asking that you fund her position, uh, fund a position, calling it a court reporter's position in the jail. And then on Fridays, the circuit judges will serve as the judge at the jail. And we're going to rotate. All seven of us will go to the jail uh, for our Fridays. And so we need this uh, court reporter position to be down there at the jail reporting these 8.1 felony hearings and arraignments. It'll get the defendants in front of a judge. They'll have a meaningful hearing. It'll move the process along and hopefully get some of these non-violent offenders out so poor people aren't just housed there because they can't get out of jail because somebody can't post $50 bond. And so it'll save the jail money. It'll get the, the defendants before the court. They will get an attorney, and it will streamline the process. And so we're not going to need the Ray Reynolds salary, but we're going to need the money uh, for a court reporter. And I proposed uh, that she be paid $120 per day which is $30 more a day than what she's been making. That would include her supplies, her tapes. Um, if she has to type up a transcript for an appeal, that would be included in that. And it's really hard to find someone who's committed to three days a week, especially on Fridays. So um, that's, the, that's the request. Rick. Yes. Justice Madison. Where, what, where do we put that in the budget? Because uh, is it in the same, would it be the same as... Um, well, it was listed as juvenile, what was it listed? No, it was listed as judicial officer something or other. Uh, it was originally listed as the judicial deten or detention de judicial officer. What page is it? Um, it is on page... Five dash eighty six. Okay, so... And but since we don't need one of the, we need to change the title because it won't be a judicial officer. We'll have actually elected mm -hmm. sitting judges handling it. Ms. Farber, where do you want this new funding to go? So um, I had given you in, in front oh. of you, is it's out of the general fund, and it'll be, the department number will be 0440, and it's called Court Reporting Services. Oh, okay. Does everybody have that one? It's two pages with... Um, Judge Zimmerman's letter attached. Um, then I would. It was added. Well, 586 was the existing budget for Judge Reynolds that she's talking about. That's the requested amount for 2017 is nothing. So we wouldn't have anything to pass there. But. Oh, it was 62,000. But this is the. 
the revision. This budget will go away on 586, and um, I would move to pass the proposed budget of $18,720 for the new fund 440 court reporting services. Second. I have a motion and a second. Do I have any other discussion? <clears throat> there is none. Car Carly, will you call the roll, please? Ann Harbison. Sharon Lloyd. Yes. Tom Lundstrom. Yes. Eva Madison. Yes. Sue Madison. Yes. Joe Maxwell. Yes. Gary McHenry. Joe Patterson. Yes. Butch Pond. Yes. Bill Ussery. Yes. Daniel Balls. Yes. Harvey Bowman. Rick Cochran. Robert Dennis. Yes. Lisa Eckie. Yes. And it passes. Thank you, Judge Zimmer. Thank you very much. I have, I have a quick question on, yes. on the uh, Harvey Jones uh, facility. Yes. Will they be providing the uh, chairs and tables and things Pardon? like that? Pardon? Will they be providing the chairs, tables? DYS is giving us $10,000 to buy all the equipment, the chairs, the furniture, Furnishings. and also a wand, the metal detector wand. We're wanding everyone as they come in. Fantastic. All right. So thank you, Judge Zimmer. Thank you so much. This is going to do a world of difference. Thank you. Okay. Next, we have Matt Durrett. On page 5-78 welcome hello thank you um, really I think that my budget just needs clarification because while there is uh, additional money requested in the non-personal services much of it has just been um, just moved from different places I think if you look the the total sum of, or the total amount that uh, additional being requested is due to, uh, is just salaries. Uh, we got a new position in the middle of last, uh, last year uh, that wasn't included in last year's budget. That's why there's an increase. Um, but it, there's an increase in other services and charges because you'll note uh, on line uh, 3102 software management, uh, software support maintenance agreement, whatever. Uh, there's an additional 18,000 in there. What we've done is we've moved it from other parts of the budget. What the, the purpose behind that is that we are in need of a new, um, a, a new uh, case management system. The case management system we use now is Psalms. It's run through the sheriff's office. However, uh, so, uh, earlier this year, the FBI and Sages, whatever, they came in to do their security audit for the sheriff's office and determined that uh, there were insufficient security measures in place in terms of uh, firewalls and whatnot because of the type of, of information that's, that, that, they, that they have, the, um, the criminal records and whatnot. Uh, they have to keep tighter reins on that. So they are what they told the sheriff's office, and I think the sheriff's office can probably explain it better than I can, but. Um, they have to put up a firewall between anyone outside of the sheriff's office. So we are no longer able to use their case management system. We're having to go out and get a new one. And what I've discovered is these things are very expensive. Um, and so what I did is uh, I moved, in light of the fact that we got a new full-time position last year, uh, I moved 10000 from our part-time salaries. I reduced that by 10000 to move it to the software uh, support line. I also took 3,000 from what we requested, what we got last year in small equipment, uh, 2,000 from other prof professional services, and then 3,000 from dues and memberships. We were paying approximately 3,000 a year for our case management system through Psalms. Uh, this one is, is much more expensive, uh, but one thing that we're doing is we're moving to a I don't want to say paperless office, but we're moving to a fileless system. Um, we think that this software will make us much more uh, effective in a number of areas. And I don't know how much it's going to cut down on cost, but I know that we spend a lot of money on paper. And we're hoping to, uh, with, this, with this new system and a, a fileless system, we'll, able to, we'll be able to do a number of things, and this will be in conjunction with when the clerk's office, circuit clerk's office goes to electronic filing, which is, I don't know the exact date, but I think that's coming within a, a year or so. Um, this is in preparation for that as well. So um, what we did is we requested 18,000 for the software, uh, 
support line. That is an estimate on what it's going to be on a, a yearly cost for this. Um, I've seen it uh, anywhere from from 14,000 to 25,000. So um, I think 18,000 is a, uh, we don't have final figures because we're still trying to uh, negotiate a contract with, with, with one group, but it should be, 18,000 should be sufficient. Um, but as I said, that's money that we have moved around. You can kind of do the math in the other areas um, and see that we've just, I just moved money around rather than coming in and requesting more. So um, if that's not clear, I'll be happy to answer any questions anyone has. Justice uh, Madison. Is it a one-time expense or is it? No, a, it's the, that's a yearly. That's every, the that's every year. It's, so it's every year it's the 19. It's not like some initial we, investment. Well, it's, it's, uh, we already had 1,000 in there. We added 18 okay, well. in there. So that's. That is roughly for the yearly support, um, and once we, um, you know, once we get everything finalized, we'll have a better idea of of how much it's going to be. But like I said, the low that I've seen is is around 14, and the highs. Benton County has, they don't have the same system we're using. We're going for something that's hopefully uh, less expensive. The Benton County Prosecutor's Office, that is, and they pay uh, 25,000 a year for theirs, and that's where I'm saying is is the high end. Okay. Uh, so, but that's that's going to be a yearly, um, a yearly cost for us. Okay, thank you. Uh, next up is uh, Justice Maxwell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, I think I speak for a lot of us. Thanks for your proactive shuffling around and making this work. And secondly, I make a motion we pass your budget. Second. I have a motion and a second. Uh, oh, one question. I have uh, Justice Lloyd. And then Justice. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, if it happens, just plain devil's advocate, if it happens to be 25000 are you going to be able to find that somewhere else in your budget? Um, I don't know. I may have to come down here and ask. I'm, I'm, uh, the, the company that we're, that we're um, negotiating with now is going to be on the cheaper end. The oh, okay. twenty five is, that's not the, the, um, the software that I prefer. Um, and so the software that I'm, I'm that I'm budgeting for is is less expensive. So unless something were to fall through in terms of uh, there's we haven't gotten to the contract point yet. We're almost there, um, but unless there's something that we can't agree on, and and Steve will have to review everything. But if there unless there's something we can't agree on and it's a deal breaker, then it's going to be eighteen thousand or less. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Justice Lloyd, uh, Justice Hecky. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think last time that you came before this court, the attitude um, in your office was pretty stressed. Yes. Could you tell us what it's like after you left here that night? It's it's well, it, it has gotten a lot better. That position has has helped quite a bit, um, and so we're still, from a standpoint of. Um, we're still busy. We're still incredibly busy. We're on we're on track to file roughly 3,200 new ca new felony cases this year, mm. um, and that's a burden. But um, there are a lot of people, especially well, a lot of people all around the office, are really excited about the fact that uh, while this this software in this case management system is very expensive, it can lighten the load of a lot of people on our staff. We're getting things we'll be getting things in electronically. And um, from police agencies, they'll come into us electronically. It'll cut down on a lot of time, uh, people making copies. Um, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of things are going to fall on, on the prosecutors themselves to do a lot of the things that we rely on staff for, but it makes it a lot easier uh, to do, and which may be why this stuff is so expensive. But there are a lot of things that you can do, such as, you know, when you've got a case, you can click on a, a button and it immediately will do up jury instructions instead of having, you know, a prosecutor type them all out or have, you know, one of our, um, one of our employees do it for them. Uh, it can automatically do that stuff. It, it can automatically do a lot of things that we take that uh, em our employees take time doing right now, such as typing up felony informations to, to charge somebody with to get ready for arraignments. There are a lot of things that help simplify everything. So 
people are excited about the prospect of this because it's it's going to lessen the burden on a lot of our employees. Now, did you add the education and training um, that goes with it, or is that part of? That's part of it. Okay. So, the, I mean. The, the, and that's going to be ongoing education and ongoing. Uh, no, I mean, unless um, there are, they have, they host, this company that we're going through hosts yearly conferences where uh, it, it would be just uh, just like a any other type of training where we'd we'd pay whatever the the fee to go to the training where they update us on any new uh, advances in the software or anything new with it. So it's not, um, but that would be. Um, I think we should have enough elsewhere in our budget to to handle it. And quite frankly, I'm I'm thinking that. Um, while well, 18,000 is kind of in the middle of what we've seen, we may be able to come in a little bit less, and so we may have a little bit left over for training. So I, it's, it's not a concern that I've got okay. in terms of funding. Okay. Thank you. Thank okay. you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Justice Eki. Any others? Well, then it's my turn. Yes, sir. The um, software that you're thinking of, does it have a community user group that your people can access and talk about the product that you're buying? with other people who have purchased it? Uh, well, we have, when we started off, um, when we started the process of looking into it, um, I'd seen some pricing and and just, it's not based on price alone. This is very user friendly and it's, it's, it's I had seen this a couple of years ago and really liked it. Um, we got, uh, IT involved early on because this is dealing with software and we know they're going to be able to play a big role. Um, they reached out, this, this is a company based out of St. Louis and virtually the entire state of Missouri uses it um, and so IT department reached out to um, numerous offices in St. Louis or in, in Missouri requesting feedback on, on the system and, and they got feedback on what they liked and, and everywhere, everyone that I've talked to, there are a couple of offices, prosecutors offices in Arkansas that use it. Mm -hmm. And, um, or there's actually one that uses it and then another that just started here within the past week or so. Um, but the one that uses it absolutely loves it. And mm -hmm. so I've got nothing but good feedback um, from everyone that we've talked to. Well, that's good to know that, you know, you're, you're finding, you know, very happy, happy users, satisfied customers out there, uh, you might consider putting together your own user group and contact these other people that are in it and uh, create an informal network outside of uh, the vendors deal. Right. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of vendors do have a user community of some type uh, that they sponsor and allow people to put questions and, and have a forum, if you will. Um, then those questions are searchable, kind of like a wiki database mm -hmm. in a sense that, well, how do I do that? How do I use this? Um, you know, it's very helpful, very beneficial. Actually, you might talk to the vendor. Uh, on another topic, um, with the, uh, well, different phase, uh, with the issue of security on the system, and you're still using the sheriff system at this time, is that correct? Yes. Okay. And they would rather you get off as quick as possible? Yes. Okay. And so they, they've <laughs> kind of given us a deadline of the first of the year okay. uh, with the kind of the understanding of if we still are ironing out the kinks with a new system, they'll kind of give us a little bit of... Well, I'm speaking for myself, but I believe that the court, if they approve this budget as it stands, would, would also approve uh, putting in as a, a request for the 2016 budget in the current year. If you get to a point where you have a um, uh, contract ready to go, I would see no reason why not to move this off of this budget and move it into 2016 and get you going and uh, preserve the sheriff's integrity as well. Okay. So with that, uh, we have any other comments? We'll go to vote. Ann Harbison? Sharon Lloyd? Yes. Tom Lundstrom? Yes. Eva Madison? Yes. Sue Madison? Mm -hmm. Joe Maxwell? Yes. Gary McHenry? Joe Patterson? Yes. Butch Pond? Yes. Bill Essery? Yes. Daniel Balls? Yes. Harvey Bowman? Rick Cochran? Robert Dennis? Yes. Lisa Eckie? Yes. And it passes. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. And next up, Sheriff Tim Hilder. We're on page 552. 
Um, if you don't mind, I wanted to make comment that in front of you is the sheriff's office's additional justification that was handed out before the meeting. Okay. Come on up this way. I won't have to crane my neck to be asking folks. I'd like to, in case there are specific questions, I can have part of our leadership team up here that's responsible for each area to help answer those questions. Um, I think everybody knows everybody up here. You all know that Major Denzer is over our detention center. Rick Hoyt is our major over enforcement. And of course, you know Chief Cantrell, who's my right hand and, and runs the whole place for me. Back in the back is uh, Kenny Yates, is captain over uh, detention in the green shirt. And then uh, Kelly is our PIO. And uh, man, she runs my life and keeps me out of trouble. <laughs> The next best thing to my wife, anyway, and then, uh, and then Carla Holcroft is our dispatch manager uh, in the gray uh, sweater. So in the event we have any trouble specific to those areas, I've got everybody here tonight. Um, I suppose I would kick off and, and uh, just make a couple of comments, and then we'll kind of, you've got a lot of paperwork in front of you pertaining to our requests and our budget. Uh, very overly familiar with the process over the last few years that um, we have have really uh, scaled back uh, on our budget requests. Um, I want to applaud you again at the start of this year of recognizing that uh, our employees are that important that you all got that on the front end of the budget and I thank you for uh, doing that. Uh, having said that, however, there are some areas that we have fallen woefully behind in over the last few years due to our, our budget uh, woes where requests were not even made for additional personnel. In fact, we've, uh, on the enforcement side, I think that we have probably gone backward uh, by three or four slots. I can't remember since 08. Our last actual addition to the enforcement personnel budget would have been in 08, and I think that was for a dispatch position. Um, and we'll get to the jail side in a moment, but uh, I think that also has uh, fallen behind. So, uh, having said that as our, as our opening, I suppose that we would just go to uh, um, we can go to, do you want to go to any specific page first on line item requests, personnel, how do you want to proceed, uh, Mr. Chairman? It's up to you. This is your show. Okay. Well, um, I don't know how your uh, paperwork is set up in front of you, but if we want to go to uh, our line item request, aside from personnel, we can talk about personnel toward the end. Uh, we can start off uh, with our small equipment request. Mm -hmm. Does everybody have that? Okay. Um, and Rick, I, I suppose uh, I will just kick it off by saying that each of our deputies have uh, rifles in their, with their units. We've been involved. There was probably a lengthy uh, description and outline for you as to how that came to be, but we got involved with the surplus program where we were able to get used weapons from the military. Uh, there's a potential that they're going to be recalled. Uh, at some point, plus they are getting old and, and uh, quite used. Um, we're wanting to upgrade those rifles to new uh, rifles with great optics and uh, for our deputies' protection out in the street. And I think if there's anything other than what I just said, Rick, you would be best to... Yeah, uh, and some of these documents that talk about the rifles and these line item explanations, you either got in an email or hand-delivered to you today. Uh, Ashley and I had a little... Uh, miscommunication back in September and she I gave her some documents and she, and I thought they went out to you and she thought uh, I was going to give her some other things which I did later so you got some stuff that I already thought you had and you got it just today you should have a document that is entitled at the top budget explanation dash 2017 budget Washington County Sheriff's Office Sheriff's budget 1000-0400 that's the document I'm working off of right now. Okay, do you see that one? It's just a narrative like this. I, yes. And it starts out with line item 2002. And then I, and I'm not going to read all this. Uh, obviously, uh, you can do that for yourself. But the, the main thing the sheriff was trying to convey is this line item 
is increased this year or for 2017 by $54,000. And the reason, I mean, it would have been flat. We would have just left it the same for 2017. But we're asking for these patrol rifles. And at the end of that document, about two pages over, you'll see a lengthy uh, description and, and definition of those rifles and justification. But uh, we want to replace the, the surplus rifles uh, with $54,000 worth of new rifles and new optics. No, it should say 54326 increased. Five fifty-two. Should be ninety-nine thousand three hundred and twenty-six dollars. Yes. We have a question from Justice Lloyd. Yes, ma'am. Uh, just because I'm curious, what will we do with the old rifles? I mean, we get these new ones, and are well, you turning them back over to the government? Well, we'll probably utilize those out in other areas of the agency that don't have any rifles right now. Uh, like so our, they won't be put in a dustbin type thing. I mean, we're going to be we're going to do something. Yeah, we'll either redeploy them or we'll send them back. Okay. To the to the government, but they they could get recalled tomorrow, or never, or next year. We don't know what's going to happen to them. But they can't. We can't really retrofit those rifles with the type of optics and the, the I don't want to get too complicated here, but the whole top of the gun has to be taken off and replaced with a different top. We could do it cheaper and than the 54000 by buying all new tops for the government guns and optics. But then what happens if the government does recall them? Then we end up having to buy guns that will fit those things. It would be better and cleaner just to buy the rifles we need. Plus, the rifles we need have shorter barrels. They have 16-inch barrels instead of 20-inch barrels. They're easier to, to move uh, around with. And the other thing is the government rifles that we received, we actually had to retrofit every one of those rifles. And by retrofit, I mean we had to take them apart and, and we had to convert those rifles from automatic weapons. Because when they come from the government, they're selective fire. They can shoot, you know, as long as you hold the trigger down. Well, we don't want those, we don't put those type of weapons out in the field because it just doesn't make sense in an urban environment to have that. So we had to go through and change all the sears and so forth inside those rifles with our department armorers. Well, if we buy these new rifles, they won't be automatic rifles. They'll be semi-automatic rifles right out of the box. We won't have to modify anything. We actually have to have an inventory of every little part and spring we took out of those government rifles, and there's an audit that has to be done on all that stuff because the government wants to make sure that those things aren't being used out in the civilian world, you know, for... for uh, so if they're if they're not if, if you don't send them back you're going to find a, a use for them. We'll find okay. a use for them. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Continue. Okay. Uh, the next line item was fuel. As you can see, I decreased uh, uh, cr decreased the fuel. And in fact, if you'll do the math, if you look back at our 2016 uh, request, the entire thing for just my uh, supplies, and don't don't put capital in there and don't put personnel in there. But if I hadn't put the rifles in there, we would have actually had a thirty thousand over a thirty thousand dollar decrease in our twenty seventeen budget. It's mm -hmm. just the rifles that's pushing it up a little bit. Uh, I did reduce fuel just based on, you know, it's kind of a well, nobody has a crystal ball on what fuel is going to be, but uh, we we guessed it at two two dollars and fifty cents. And remember, that's we get eighteen cents a gallon discount, so it could actually be at two sixty eight, you know, and uh, we'd still be good. Uh, we did, our cell phone line item did go up uh, for next year and uh, half of this year. We uh, decided it was time, you know, our, all of our officers in the field have cell phones, but it was time to move them to smartphones where we can send them emails in the field, where we can send them text messaging, and we're getting ready to activate a new feature in our uh, computer-aided dispatch system we'll, where we'll be able to send mass text out to our people in the field or to certain divisions. So it was time. But that's, uh, I think we pay $31 a month for uh, a regular cell phone, and, it's, and it goes up to like $50 a month for a smartphone. And the phones were free. 
So that's why that has increased by $9,000 for next year. Fleet liability I reduced just because the price is down and I don't see why I should leave money on the table when I need it in other places. Um, uh, same thing with dues and membership. And then we come down to 4002 capital outlay on buildings. Now, there's not an amount in there, but you do have a document that you received last week. It has some color pictures on it. It's a one-page front and back. It has some uh, different vehicles and so forth on it. And that is a request for $10,000 for a building. Now, what we're wanting is basically, you know, when you drive by and you see these little carports that people have. We're wanting a pretty large one. We're wanting a 30 by 60 because we have several vehicles that are out in the weather right now and we would like to get them under cover, at least under a roof. It doesn't have to have sides on it necessarily, but it's just kind of a pole barn with a gravel, gravel floor staked to the ground so it won't blow away. And uh, when we checked around and the price is up near $10,000. You know, last there is a typo in that one document. It says our fire prevention and uh, life safety trailer uh, was put into use in 2017. That should have said 2016, and because uh, we did put it in use this year. That's a 39-foot trailer that we spent about 70,000, a little more than 70,000 dollars on, and it's a beautiful trailer. We had it on display out at the Washington County Fair recently, and hopefully you got to see that. We're taking that around to. Uh, elderly groups, we're taking it to all the schools and giving uh, um, presentations. But the problem is, it's a nice, beautiful, state-of-the-art trailer and it's out in the weather. And you know what snow load does when it sits on something? You know what hail does? You, you know, constant rain and, and just sun. So we would like to get that under cover. We've got uh, two T-Rex uh, UTV vehicles that Walmart was kind enough to donate to us a couple years ago. $50,000 worth of equipment and a trailer and all the lights and everything and we use that. Those at all the ball games, we use them on searches, we use them and those things are out in the weather more than they should be. Um, we would like to get those undercover. We have two boats and a lot of you don't know that we have a boat and patrol and we have a dive team and we have a pontoon boat uh, with uh, electronics on it that uh, for helping us search out, you know, recover bodies and evidence. And we would like <coughs> to get that undercover. And we have a patrol boat that we take out and patrol on our portion of Beaver Lake. We would like to get that undercover. So that's what that 10000 is for. Uh, and that pretty much takes us through the sheriff's budget. Uh, until we get to the new personnel request. Capital. Oh, well, yes, I guess vehicles. we have vehicles. Mm -hmm. Now, we, we came to you last year and asked for uh, four by four Tahoes, and we got six of those uh, Tahoes, and uh, those are almost deployed right now. Uh, we've got a couple out, and they're working on the other ones. We are asking for just two wheel drive Tahoes. Um, you have a separate form that you should have gotten last week. And it's entitled Capital Expense Request for 2017 and $266,312. It's a narrative. And uh, it's just based on, on mileage and replacement. I will say that, you know, we used to change out our Crown Victoria police cars at around the 80 to uh, 90,000 mark. And when I say change out, we would, those would become hand me down units to areas in the agency that are less uh, critical instead of being out on patrol. Uh, we, when the Crown Victoria platform was discontinued, we decided to go with the Tahoe platform. And we got our first one with a grant, and then from then on, the, the court had provided the funds we need to keep our fleet going. I think I have about 35 of those Tahoes uh, in service right now, and, but we still have a few Crown Victorias. We have found that the Tahoe is a more hardy vehicle. It's holding up better. And uh, I talked to a, a patrol lieutenant the other day, and he believes that we'll get 120,000 miles out of the Tahoes. And that's a lot, that's a, that's a big increase. And of course, those vehicles were more expensive, and there were some questions uh, several years ago when we came to the court and asked for monies. But it's holding out true that we are getting better mileage uh, out of the Tahoes, and we haven't even retired the first one yet. So. 
Uh, we are asking to continue that program based on the mileage that we'll have at the end of next year. We're going to need to replace eight of those Tahoes. And uh, we're not asking for four by fours. We, uh, we, we got the four by fours last year, and we think that'll, that'll carry us through. Any members of the court have questions? Okay. Do you want to cover? Uh, Justice Maxwell. I'm sorry. Question for Ms. Ashley. How much was um, total fuel costs on this 2016 expenditures? How far does that run? Is that just through June or is that? June 30th. Okay. You know what to date is? I can tell you, yes. <coughs> Excuse me. It'll take me just a second. I apologize. It's not fair that we get to fling random questions at you. So. Well, it might even be built by our prisoners. Pardon? Well, we we have a couple. We have a couple of those down there now, and uh, that that the. Uh, community service uses and transport uses to put their vans under. And uh, so we want to just kind of put the same kind up. I think, uh, th don't get me to telling the story here because it was Randall's group that did all this, but I think they had the first one put up by the company and then the, the prisoners watched how it was put together and then they were able to put up the other one or two that we have down there. So we've, we've got a little city of little <laughs> garages down there now. And this will just add to it, uh, and so we'll we'll utilize our local labor where we can. But uh, yeah, we do that all the time, and to try to save a nickel or a dime. While we're waiting, Justice Lundstrom has a question. I doubt if anybody has any problem with the rifle expenditure, but I was wondering what caliber you're going to get. Will it be two twenty ones or it's, nine mil? I think it's two. two I think it's the same caliber. It's a 223. 223. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, some may think that a rifle just lays in the trunk of a car and doesn't get used, but if you just qualify with a rifle once or twice a year, over several years, several hundred rounds go through that rifle. Correct. Whether you ever use it in the field or not. And in the course of doing that, you know, the rifle gets wear in the chamber, the barrel, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm really happy. I think that's a good expenditure personally because our police officers need to be as well equipped as they can be in that particular area with the situation as it is becoming yes, sir. worse and worse every day. Where we used to not find rifles that critical, you used to just use shotguns. These rifles are becoming more and more important, so I'm really happy to see you doing that. Just want to thank you for it. Yeah. Back to Justice Maxwell's question. Okay, um, currently year to date, as of October, is one hundred seventeen thousand sixty-four dollars and fifty-four cents. Any other questions? Any motions? I make a motion. Oh well, we're not through with the budget. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would, you want to go all the way through, right? To, at least on well, the enforcement side. This, uh, well, uh, we probably got need to talk about the personnel next because that's that's within this budget. Personnel, the new personnel yeah, in communications, communications that, because that's <coughs> within this budget. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So uh, you should have a document that you received last week. That was uh, it looks like this on the cover. Okay, it says Washington County Sheriff's Office Communications Staffing Study. Well, we'll see if that's a separate budget. I don't know your page numbers or anything like that because I had my own copy first. <laughs> yeah. Pardon? Yeah. Is it? Okay. And uh, it should be in color and it should be probably 34 pages, 35 pages long. And I'm going to go through every single page. No, I'm not. <laughs> I, want to, I want to applaud uh, Carla Holcroft, our communications dispatch manager, right back here, who prepared this. And, and uh, without going through the thing, she supplied you with a lot of information. And you can go to the last page where we draw a conclusion, and you can go to the first couple of pages where we just tell you we need more dispatchers. It's been since 2008, 
since we've increased our dispatch staff. Our dispatch uh, center is, uh, as, you, as you read through there, you see the level of expertise that we've attained. Uh, you see Carla has the initials RPL beside her name. You say, what is that? That means she's a registered uh, public safety leader. She had to attain some special credentials, and there are not very many of them uh, in the United States or in Arkansas. She's a trainer for other dispatchers in the state of Arkansas. So when she put this together, she, she wanted, I mean, this is actually cut down. I went through and edited all sorts of stuff out of it because it was just voluminous, and it still is voluminous because she's passionate about explaining to you she needs people. It's busy in there. She's interested in public safety. And you, you have to remember that we are dispatching, not just for the rural people, but every one of these little towns out here. I think we've dispatched for 10, 10. small cities. So we dispatch for the Farmington officers and the Farmington citizens that call 911. We dispatch for the West Fork people, the Prairie Grove people, uh, the Elkins folks, the Tawny Town, and the Elm Springs. So there's a lot going on. We, uh, many of you have toured our dispatch center. Uh, it's a wonderful place. We've got great equipment now. We've, we need to, we have some empty slots in there at that, at that furniture. And we have busy days. You'll see some charts in there. We did some, uh, Carla did some case studies of some events. And you'll see some charts in there. And they may mean something to you if you really dig down deep. But what it tells us, there are many times that we are simply overloaded in that center and can't keep up. And phone calls are, I'm not saying they're going unanswered, but they're not getting the total attention they need because the dispatcher's having to put this person on hold to deal with this situation over there. There's four case studies in there that I would you know, urge you to look at. Um, if you go to the, to the uh, last page, I talk about our calls are going up, and there are charts in there about how much our calls have gone up. If you also look, there's a chart in there on one of the pages that shows the total number of staff in all of the dispatch centers. And if you notice, Washington County has, is doing a tremendous job with the least amount of personnel. You can do the math every which way you want to. We're doing it with less. And so we probably need more than the three that we're asking for. But that's all she's asking for is three. So I would uh, welcome your questions. If it gets too deep, I'll have to have Carla come up here and bail me out. But uh, she did a great job on this report, and I, I hope it's given you some information to uh, hopefully support this. Anyone? Justice Bond. What's the turnover rate been? Well, there's actually a chart in there. What kind of turnover, yeah, on the, on the dispatcher? I, I'll have to find it. It's actually in here, and I'll have to see what page it's on. Let's see. Well, I understand those folks are under quite a lot of stress. It's very high. Very it may be on page 11 of that report. Let me look. So, yeah, it's 72.78% yeah. uh, is our retention rate. And the national average is 83% uh, percent, that they keep 83% of their staff. And we have fallen below that now. And we don't like being below the national standards. Uh, in 2004, it was 83%. In 2009, it was 81% national average. And our... Our average this year is at 72, almost 73 percent. So we have, we're only retaining 73 percent of our staff. Remember, she also put a bunch of information on there on what it takes to be a dispatcher. It takes, in training, at least six months before we can turn a person solo uh, on the phones and on the radio system and on the computer-aided dispatch system. All the things they have to learn, and they have a, a, a system where they train them every day, they get daily observation reports, and this person is not turned loose solo till they're ready. But the problem is, 
we're spending six months or more uh, Washington County salary money getting this person ready. It's an investment we make. We need to retain that investment because if that person gets overwhelmed later and says, oh, there's just too much, I have to work too much, or it's just too stressful in here, there's not enough help, and they leave us, then we start at ground zero again at, and have to spend another six months. So it's, it's an incumbent upon us to retain all the personnel. Now, Carla's been with this, what, 18, 19, 19 years? years yeah. So, you know, we do have some career uh, people here, but we need to retain, retain all, all the people we can that are good. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anyone else? I'd make a motion we pass this budget. We have a motion and a second. Any other discussion? There's none. Carly? Ann Harbison? Sharon Lloyd? Yes. Tom Lundstrom? Yes. Eva Madison? Yes. Sue Madison? Yes. Joe Maxwell? Yes. Gary McHenry? Joe Patterson? Yes. Butch Pond? Yes. Bill Ussery? Yes. Daniel Balls? Yes. Yeah. Harvey Bowman? Rick Cochran? Robert Dennis? <laughs> yes. Lisa Eppie? Yes. And it passes. Oh. She's a superstar. Well, that's what we're going to go. 552. Yeah. I thought we were on 5138. No, 552 has the three, has the three, a uh, little confusion as to what bat budget okay. we were on. Okay. So now we're, now we're going to move to page 5138. Okay. For the communication budget. Thank you. Uh, this is the uh, communications budget. And uh, I would remind you uh, again at the outset that this is not a general fund expenditure. This, is, this fund is supported by uh, monies that come in from fees and so forth. Mm -hmm. So we hope, you know, it doesn't have any bearing on taking away anything from the general fund <laughs> or so forth. And there's money that comes in uh, every month into that fund to support these requests. I have... Uh, it has gone up a little bit. Our request for 2017 is, is above the 2016 level, and it's mainly due to a uh, page that you would have gotten today, I think, that says capital item request at the top of it, 2017 budget, Washington County Sheriff's Office, communications facility slash equipment. So one, I think it's just a one-page uh, form, and it starts out, with an expenditure of 100 and, or it says 156,000. Do you all see that document? Okay, I guess it is two pages. One page and then it's a little tiny bit on the second one. Um, I apologize because I do not have our IT manager from the Sheriff's Office here with us tonight. Sir. I have a question from Justice Madison. Yeah. Can, Ms. Farber, can you tell us how much is in, is in this fund? I don't know that we need a Or projected. Uh, give me just a second. Three zero one four. You're wanting what is projected for 2017? Yes, I guess. Okay. Um, the projected revenue to budget is four hundred sixty-four thousand nine hundred eighty, and their requested budget is four thirty-two seven hundred, which leaves unappropriated thirty-two thousand two eighty. And I would move to pass that budget. I second. second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Do we have any other discussion? Carly, please. Ann Harbison. Sharon Lloyd. Yes. Tom Lundstrom. Yes. Eva Madison. Yes. Sue Madison. Yes. Oh. Joe Maxwell. Yes. Gary McHenry. Joe Patterson. Yes. Butch Pond. Yes. Bill Essery. Yes. Daniel Balls. Yes. Harvey Bowman. Rick Cochran. Robert Dennis. Yes. Lisa Eckie. Yes. Thank you. This Has anybody passes. seen Ann Harbison? Pardon? Has anybody seen Ann Harbison? I think she's at the concert in Prairie Grove. Oh, the concert. No. That rocker. Okay, thank you. Really? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. It's on a farm. I just it's wanted to know if somebody called. She's never missed a never meeting. Missed. Never missed. <laughs> and she won't give me her cell phone number because of FOIA. You know? <laughs> so, you didn't do it? Okay. Uh, she may have gotten caught in traffic know. for the okay. concert. I don't know. 
Okay. We have a bunch of deputies working that thing tonight. And I, well, if you see her in jail, we'll come get her uh, out, okay? We drove by there. In fact, we just wanted to go by and check on our folks. Went to Prairie Grove, went to Illinois Chapel, and this was prior to, to lunchtime. And, of course, there were already the stage was already up, outhouses everywhere, lights, buses. And there were people lined up. You wouldn't believe it, y'all. There were, there were people lined up all on both sides of the entrance all the way back, groupies, I guess, waiting for the gates to open at 1, I think. And the concert doesn't start. He doesn't come on until 9 or 9.30, so I, I don't well, I know. That's Ann was there. Three. Ann was sighted. I don't know. I, <laughs> I don't want to start any rumors about Ann. Okay, we're uh, on to 5-142. So now, now on to the monster. 5-142 is where we're the monster. Um, so I suppose, Randall, we'll just start. Uh, I will uh, get this kicked off, then I'll defer to Jay and Randall on the majority of these items. But uh, we can start with uh, each request individually, or if you have questions on them, I'm assuming that you have the 2017 Washington County Detention Center justifications in front of you, that list. Starts off with... Uh, uh, 2012 bulletproof vests. Do you see that? This is one of those they've got, right? Yes, this should be actually in your binder, your blue book. Okay. Um, 5 142. Thank you. I'll, I'll kind of talk while you're looking, but uh, the first the first uh, request that deals with bulletproof vests, and the majority of those are basically um, replacements. They have an expiration life, uh, the vests, and we have to replace those periodically. I think it's every five years. Am, five I, years. am I on? Five years is the life of them. And uh, at any rate, that's that amount is is 35 uh, of those, which will increase that. Uh, 2012 line item by $30,000. Oh, yeah. We got some real disappointing uh, news. We applied uh, for a, 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 I'll get the name wrong, but it was a rural uh, grant, basically. And uh, we received notification that we were approved on the best uh, request. I don't remember, uh, Fayetteville, Fayetteville and Springdale both got. Uh, wasn't a, a huge amount, but that would help, right? We got uh, $38. <laughs> what? It cost him more than $38 to write that check. <laughs> $38. Well, and then so we called it. I don't want to bore you with the whole thing, but I was a little frustrated uh, that Fable and Springdale would get that amount, and their total, you know, the way they do it is they do it by the uh, latest census, on the total county population, and we tried to explain, well, we're not responsible for the population in Fayetteville or Springdale. They've got their own police departments and even the small towns. So our number is much lower. Well, that they just they don't want to dig that deep into the weeds, so they just take the whole census. But at any rate, 38 bucks. So we'll be offsetting that 35,000 by 38 dollars. So um, frustrating. Uh, the next one on our list is uh, uh, 3021, which is postage, and uh, that's an increase of $20,000. Uh, is that right, Randall? Total. It's, 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 double. it's not an increase? It's from 10000 to 20000 Oh, 20000 is the total. It's for all those okay. love letters they send out uh, to court. <laughs> that's just, I think we got caught up in the budget uh, trying to re do reductions last year, and we reduced that line item significantly. And reality is they we, like, they like to write letters. and we have oh, to provide the postage right. the postage the letters the envelopes the whole thing you have to email. give to them and uh, all their legal email mail that goes out access. did you say do emails <laughs> no. <laughs> no. okay next will be laptops for every detainee <laughs> to do. Um, so anyway that's just reality that's one of the things that uh, but probably the biggest thing that we want to talk about tonight is is our uh, medical and dental and hospital expenses. Two years ago, we convinced you to help us to, to move to uh, a company that would provide these services. And uh, we promised you that, and I think Eva, uh, Justice Madison, you were very adamant about we got to keep our eye on this these kind of 
operations because we don't want to get caught up in not giving adequate service because it's, they're not going to make any money or whatever. Because the bottom line in the private sector is what it's all about. Well, we became very dissatisfied with our first experience. Um, but we did recognize the value in having somebody else that has an expertise in dealing with institutional uh, medical care. So we let it out for bid again. And uh, we had a local group, uh, the Karis Medical Group, that, that put in for this. And uh, we took a chance, basically, you know, because they weren't necessarily experienced in the uh, detention or incarcerated population, uh, but they were very enthusiastic and committed to this community in providing uh, health care. So we, we took a chance. They were uh, low bidder, I think, uh, or very close. I think they were low. And uh, you guys, I couldn't be more pleased. I'm telling you, we're, we're coming to the close of our first year uh, with, our, with our last group. And even before, when we had employed physicians, they were there probably a total of the officers on four one, day, hours. one day a week, but yeah. for four hours to try and see requests from 600 detainees. This doctor is there no less than four days a week, and when he's not there, and even when he is there, we have nurse practitioners. Uh, we've got, uh, I couldn't be more pleased. We have gone from about 56 known filings of lawsuits in federal court to, I think we're down to maybe four that deal with, right, with medical, medical care. They are phenomenal. Um, but I think the biggest part is they're from our community and they care. Um, so now that takes us to the, the uh, the request that we put in uh, on the behalf of that that provider, and that increase would total, um, I think it's a hundred and fifty thousand dollar increase over last year. Um, this will take a little explanation. I'll try and do my best, Randall and, and Jay. You just jump in if you need to. But the base contract um, was at a, I think it was at right at one million. Yes. We're requesting an increase to the base contract of a hundred thousand dollars. Uh, to cover the expense of the additional employees and different services that they provide uh, for us at the jail. And then if you'll remember, we have a uh, pool of money that uh, was designated to take care of uh, pharmaceutical requests, off-site visits where, where they can't basically deal with something and they have to go to the emergency room or to a specialist. Um, we're requesting an increase from that uh, uh, pool from uh, I think it's 150,000 to 200,000. We're going to be very close this year of expending every dime in that. If we we may even go over the 100, 150,000. But what we're proposing to do is to remove them from the pool. If you'll recall, it was set up so that if we had money left over in the pool, then that leftover money would be split between the county and the medical provider. Kind of an incentive for them to keep from sending people. Well, we revisited that and we've spoken to the doctors and I think they've, they've proven themselves to be high integrity. Uh, that part <coughs> is not all about the, the bottom line and they want to make sure that the public knows it's not. They're about care. So what we're recommending is to increase that to $200,000, remove them from the pool potential. If we, if we stay under, the county keeps the money. It's not split with them. Um, and, it, and it, you kind of get what I'm saying. It kind of removes that, that hazy area, Eva, that you had talked about. You know, well, are they doing it for the right? Are they treating? Are they not treating because they can make more money? Uh, so we'd like to move in that direction. And then uh, the last part of that proposal is on the uh, deductibles. Hopefully most of you are aware that, that whenever a detainee makes a request for medical, we instituted years ago that there's a deduct. They have to pay copay. Uh, copay. I'm sorry, deductible. Copay to see the the physician. That was for a couple of reasons, but probably the primary one was for us in management was to keep from frivolous visits. Just they wanting to get out of their cell or, or do something. And uh, so what we're proposing to do on this is the ones that uh, we're going to ask for an increase in that copay. And then that copay service go directly to the physician's group. That does not prevent anybody from getting that service. If we have indigent folks that have no money in their commissary, obviously they're going to get the same treatment. They just don't pay. So we think this is a better plan. 
to assist with this group that we're very happy with and we hope that we have long term. I think that it will benefit the county in the long run. So that's that's that on the medical. Did you have a question? Any questions there? I have a question from Justice Maxwell. Okay. Kind of a com uh, comment, I guess, but I've had the chance to look at some of our sister counties on some of this medical uh, expenses, and I, I will I will just commend good leadership saves a lot of money, and, and we have some counties that are spending a lot more than this because they're being forced to provide some services, and it's good health care, it's good quality things, but it's not their choice because of some things in the past. And so I'll just say I appreciate the fact that we aren't paying some overages and aren't paying things that we could be. This 150000 extra that you're requesting um, wouldn't be a drop in the bucket for what some counties are having to pay for their their additional care and the additional things they're having to do to keep up compliance with their new rules. So thanks for managing it the way you are. Thank you. Justice Ussery. Uh, I kind of echo the same sentiments, and I, I would think that while it's costing us this much more, if we've dropped that dramatically in those lawsuits, it wouldn't take too many to get gain a lot more than this back. Is that a correct I assumption? I hope you'd pick up on that. I, if, if nothing else, just my ability to sleep at night a little bit more, I'm telling you. Because, you know, we went from uh, just kind of a uh, not quite a seven-day coverage with nurses and uh, not 24 hours to now. We're 24-7 we're with this group. And uh, we're, we're just, I couldn't be more pleased. I'm, I'm telling you. Very good. Our attorney has a comment. I uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I, I just want to tell the folks uh, how hard Randall, in particular, worked on this contract. I worked with him in January and February, but uh, I've done a little bit of checking back with him periodically, just kind of see how things were going. And one of the first things he said is going great. We have. A third, I think, as many lawsuits in the first com uh, conversation I had with you about three months ago about this. Every time we uh, there's a lawsuit filed against uh, us, and the jail is a source of a great many of them, as you all know, uh, we pay a $500 deductible. Um, just the fact that you've gone from that number to four uh, is uh, that drops, uh, you know, $500 a pop. Um, and as you all well know, any successful judgment against us, uh, you know, puts at risk not only the management fund, but if we go above $350,000. So uh, I, I don't often, I try not honestly to speak on policy, but this really has worked out well, this entire arrangement. And uh, um, just looking at it from the risk management side of it, uh, <laughs> on this side, it looks to have done, a, it looks to be a very, very good deal for the county. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, one, one of the things that uh, you had mentioned back when we first uh, broached the issue of, of using an outside service is reducing the number of transports because uh, there is a certain amount of element of risk anytime we take them away from the facility. Mm -hmm. Have you noticed a dramatic decrease in these transports? Do you have the number? I don't, I don't, I don't have the number, but yes, we have. Before, they couldn't do any stitching or anything, and with the nurse practitioners and the doctor there, you know, I don't know how many, but several. Every time there's a fight or somebody's hurt, they would have to leave the facility. Now they're staying right. here. And that's two people plus patrol time. There, there's money saved yeah. right there by having this service in-house in this fact and with the extra coverage. So it's right. it's working out as you as you plan. And Jay made mention uh, or at least commented that we're keeping this money local. You know, it's not mm -hmm. going to a group yeah. out of Tennessee or Texas right. or somewhere else. So I, I'm really pleased uh, that we went in this direction, but I'm, I'm really pleased with them. Uh, they have done a fabulous job. And someone's sneaking up on you. I think he wants to speak. Nope. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Okay. Well, uh, Captain Yates just reminded me that uh, our workers' comp issues, if we have somebody that's injured on the job, they will see those uh, people for free. Uh, get them evaluated and determine if they need to go on for further treatment or if it's something that uh, needs uh, additional care. So, so they they do that at no charge just because you know they're just good community partners. So, uh, they've been really really good as the sheriff said. They've uh, they've been really invested in the community and uh, you know actually have compassion and empathy and so That's it's a good not bonus. just about the bottom line for them. Okay, sheriff, go ahead. Okay, uh, so next up is our personnel requests. Um, I guess I would just 
start off by saying I, I've, I've uh, <coughs> not brought forward a lot of these requests through the last few years because of our budget uh, situation. And I'm not saying that it's all hunky-dory right now where we can do all this, but I think it's incumbent upon me to make sure you understand what our needs are. Just as Rick explained with our dispatch center, uh, we have some uh, real needs on the detention side. Um, I think I will start off with uh, probably the, the highest ranking position that we're requesting, and that is that of a uh, administrative lieutenant's position. Um, this job, I, the list is there of what all the responsibilities will be, but the main thing that this is going to do for us, I, in my mind, is to free up our shift lieutenants to be on the shifts and dealing with the problems that we have back in the uh, blocks. Because what we're having to do now is to draw our, our night shift people in a lot of the times to work administrative duties. Uh, our day shift people are having to be drawn over to deal with administrative responsibilities. What we believe will happen with this administrative lieutenant position, they can take care of uh, basically all of the uh, organizing and everything of pre-hires, of, of taking care of uh, uh, polygraph examinations, making sure that they're coordinating with Kelly, our in-house HR person, to make sure that these people are lined up uh, in a timely manner. But also, uh, there's probably 20 things listed here, but they're liaison with the 309 program with the state, uh, maintaining files on promotions and uh, tracking current job openings. I, I could go on and on, but this is a very need, uh, needed position. But it's administrative. It doesn't sound real sexy, and it's not like, you know, this person's going to save anybody from, from getting uh, beat up back in the jail. But it, what it is going to do is free up administratively all lieutenants to work the shifts they were hired to do. So there's that one. And then, uh, let's see, Randall, we have... Uh, also on this, you might, you know, we usually end up hiring over 30 people a year. And the time, you know, uh, an application is 90 days. Sometimes they almost expire before we get this done. So this lieutenant will oversee that. And you know, we have 16 hours of a mandated training we have to do every year now. And you have to make sure that everybody gets that done. So them two jobs right there, and then also our jail standards is 80 hours now, and you have nine months to get somebody through the uh, course. So to get to make all this happen is, is quite, a, quite a chore. Okay, thank you. Um, and then, Randall, I, I'd say you were J1. If you want to, just jump in and let's talk about the four DFC positions and uh, what's been cast upon us by federal court and mandates uh, there. Go ahead, Randall. Well, on our, uh, with our lawsuits, we have been going down through the years. You know, the magistrate will make real strong suggestions about things. And we had an <laughs> uh, issue come up about our uh, uh, part of the classification and uh, – I think of the right word. Uh, our due process. Just our due process. We, are, we had one system in place we'd used for several years. She told us it wasn't good enough, that we need to get our affairs in order and have a due process. And she didn't She didn't stutter a bit. And so we come back <laughs> and we started looking into this. And we had, had to get some training out of Texas. But it took three people to have the due process and the discipline uh, teams, what we call them now. So anytime anybody's in jail, and they get made a trustee or any movement or any anybody gets in a fight, they have to go through this process. And it's almost like going uh, to a regular court. They get to have a hearing, and you have a judge and a prosecutor, you would call them that, and a person to help them out to make sure they get their due process. And some of this I know is kind of hard to swallow, but it's got, it's got to happen. If you don't, you've violated your rights. So we got to, our, our turn, Steve may want to comment on this. He probably set it up better than I can, but... We had to bring people in from Texas. We went through training. We got a, a whole plan of attack, and uh, we've showed it to the, the judge and the magistrate who come down and looked at it personally. Keep in mind that most of our people are uh, pre-trial, have not been adjudicated yet, so different set of rules for people that haven't been convicted versus people that have been convicted. So uh, that's our biggest population is pre-trial people. So. so that's three of those positions yes. that were taken directly from the detention center to focus all their attention on the disciplinary process and due process. And then there's one other position, Randall, that we took from the Also on our, our magistrate that uh, we've told her about the cameras we have and we try to show them in court what we've done. And she wants to see all these different angles. And our camera system only works for 90 days and it falls off the, off the computer. 
And she, we tried to explain that to her, and she said, thought that we was trying to destroy evidence. I said, no, we wasn't. So we checked in to making this maybe last a year or up to three years. We only got three years to file a lawsuit. Well, uh, when we looked into that or IT, it was going to cost a million dollars to keep storage. Yes, that's exactly what we said. <laughs> we're like, there's no way. So we would go back, and this officer here, all he does is looks through every uh, lawsuit, lawsuit or fight or any, any incident that happens in the jail. We've got a 90-day window now to go back and get it recorded off before it falls off our system. And that's all he does is deal with the, the court and our incidents that's going on trying to satisfy her because we told her we're not trying to hide anything. You know, we're, here's what we have. Here's our system. And uh, so that's what he does full time now. And that's only when we can predict that a filing is going to be made. Yeah. And guess how long it takes to review an eight-hour video? Eight hours. Eight hours. <laughs> yes, that's the hard part. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, that's basically that guy's full-time job is looking at the, these videos <laughs> on stock. And so, no, I'm telling you, it's, it's tough. And so then that brings us to the, uh, the uh, transport, two positions in transport, Randall. Yes, at this time, at, uh, you know, the courts, uh, we have more transports in a lot of different places. We're taking these people, and same way of going out of state. We usually provide you with them statistics each month. But we're also wanting to do more training. As you know, the more training we do, the better we get. And we have about 16 people in there now, and we still can't keep up. We use a lot of overtime. We use part-timers and people out of the jail. And if these two people would try to bring, bring us up to speed to make our out-of-state trips, but also to have a better training program to go along uh, with everything. The training program that Randall's referring to, for the most part, would be, uh, I think I've described to you before, the field training program we have for our field deputies. After they get out of the academy, then they go through 16 weeks of a hands-on, learn the job, and uh, from the guys that are doing the job, but it's very specific and credentialed. That's what we want to do within our transport system because they're driving marked units and they need to be able to respond to calls in the same manner that a field deputy would be. So it would just up the level of our ability to handle uh, the specific job. So that covers all the personnel requests. And then uh, the last thing up would be our capital request. And I think it just goes right back to our vehicle replacement uh, plan that we've been involved in for the last several years. I think it's for five Tahoes. And that's at $177,285. And that's it for us. That was easy, wasn't it? Justice Lloyd, did you still have something? No. Anybody? <laughs> I'll make yes. a motion to pass this budget. Okay. The motion in a second. Any other comments? And Carly, you call our roll. Ann Harbison? Sharon Lloyd? Yes. Tom Lindstrom? Yes. Eva Madison? Yes. Sue Madison? Joe Maxwell? Yes. Gary McHenry? Joe Patterson? Yes. Butch Pond? Yes. Bill Ussery? Yes. Daniel Balls? Yes. Harvey Bowman? Rick Cochran? Robert Dennis? Yes. Lisa Ecke? Yes. It passes. Sheriff, I have a question for you that's off the budget. Earlier, our, our court has uh, put forth a, a plan for salaries. Uh, for the employees trying to catch up with some of the other folks that are a little bit behind scale. How's your morale? You, you've got about half the employees of our county, so I'm just curious, how, what, what impact is, have you noticed? Well, very well received, obviously, and uh, there's a level of excitement we haven't seen in a while, uh, a little disbelief, you know, because, you know, they don't understand what you all have to do in managing a huge budget. Um, but I want to tell you, for the first time in a while, they feel very much appreciated. Um, and we'll do our job, continue to do our job to try and fulfill those other ends of uh, job satisfaction. It's, it's not all about money. You all know that. But this is really, uh, it's really peak morale uh, good. Good. Good in a way we haven't seen in a while. So thank you all again uh, for helping us do that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you for coming tonight. Thank you. Do you have any, uh, are you all going to talk about scheduling tonight? I mean, as far as, or do you anticipate when we might actually get down in the nuts and bolts and try and, I'm trying to look at my schedule, too, to figure out. I don't out. have that schedule. Okay. Uh, Judge Edwards might have it. Uh, you check with her when she gets back in town. Thank you. Thank you. It, it may, yeah, I don't even think our next week agenda is available <laughs> to us this time. All right. Actually, our final page, 158.
right next um, to your blue tab. Yes. This is the court cost and fines fund. And basically how I um, prepared for the 2017 budget is I contacted the company we currently have our revenue bond with, and she gave me the amounts. So these are the amounts. There will be some credits that we re will receive that will offset this amount a little bit come June, she said, of next year. But for the most part, this is the amount we would be paying for 2017. And it's not a general fund item either? No, it's not. Any questions? Yes, Justice Lloyd. Thank you. I can ask you this. On looking, I, I just need this for clarification for myself. Actual budget, 358000 but actual expenditures, is that up till now? Uh, no, this is as of June 30th, 2016. Oh, June 30th. All of the budgets you're seeing is June 30th. Okay, yes. got you. Yes. Okay, thank you for answering that. Any other questions? Do I hear a motion? We would pass this first. Motion in a second. Any further discussion? Here's none. Carly, please. Ann Harbison. Sharon Lilly. Yes. Tom Lundstrom. Yes. Eva Madison. Yes. Sue Madison. Joe Maxwell. Yes. Gary McHenry. Joe Patterson. Yes. Butch Pond. Yes. Bill Essery. Yes. Daniel Balls. Yes. Harvey Bowman. Rick Cochran. Robert Dennis. Yes. Lisa Eckie. And it passes. And the final item on our agenda tonight is adjournment. I make a motion to adjourn. Motion? Second. All in favor? Aye.